we're on the air. Good morning, everybody, and happy holidays. Uh, this is the regular open meeting of United Laguna Woods Mutual Board of Directors, a California nonprofit mutual benefit corporation. Today is Tuesday, December 11th. It's 9.30, and we are in the boardroom of the community center. Uh, we have a quorum. We have one director missing. Director Akrakar is in India, and he wanted to call in, but he couldn't get... He's, he's watching the live broadcast now. Oh, he's watching our live broadcast on TV. Very good. Well, hi, Cash. <laughs> uh, he's, he's at a wedding. And if any of you are familiar at all with Indian weddings, they take a long time and they're gorgeous and we can't wait for him to come back and show us the pictures. Uh, <clears throat> this morning I'd like to ask Director Addington to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, of United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, God indivisible, with, with liberty and, and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, media? All right, Brooke is here. And of course, we have our wonderful DMS staff upstairs who are filming us. Uh, approval of the agenda. Do I have any additions or corrections to the agenda? Yes, Director. <clears throat> yes, I, I have some corrections. I tried to turn them in yesterday afternoon, but I guess I was too late. Um, on page 304, uh, item 15G, um, it has my name down for reporting on the security community access, and that should be either Torum or Bastani. Then on page, um, it's agenda item 5A, page 2 of 56. Uh, item 8, uh, second line down, that should be the... Excuse me, I think you're looking at the minutes. Yeah, the minutes. All we're doing is the agenda right now, right. please. Okay. So don't go through anything else. When we get to the minutes, then we'll look, whatever. Is there anything right. else on the agenda? Okay. Hearing none, it is uh, approved without objection. Okay, now we have the minutes. All right, you wanted page what, five? Yes, uh, on agenda item 5A, page 2 of 56, item 8, that should be uh, the second line. Uh, Dr. Blackwell commented that the 100-day test, 100-day. Item eight, responses to the foreign speakers. I'd like to comment me? on that. I'd like that to say 100 day, yes. And I would like to say test report will be on December. The test, the report, not the test. Okay. The report will be December 13th. Very we've, good. We've completed it. I agree. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We will make that change. Okay. <clears throat> Any other additions or corrections to the minutes? Uh, I have uh, another one here on uh, item, uh, again, agenda 5A, page 15 of 56. I don't know if this is necessary or not, but I'm just going to suggest it. Uh, just above item 14, where it says President Skillman called for the vote of the original resolution, mm -hmm. motion. I added the word as amended. I don't know if that's necessary or not, but President Skillman called for the vote of the original resolution, motion as amended. We amended that originally. That's All right, well, before we had the vote on the amendment. But it, yeah. it does sound better to say the vote on the amended resolution. Okay. okay. All right, we're going to like that for sure. Okay, then... You got uh, that, Cheryl? I have... Uh, then on um, page 55, 56, 
Again, agenda item 5A. We had corrected the language in part of this where we changed the or to and, but we didn't change it in the resolution. And this was on the uh, land use mm -hmm. alteration policy on page 55, 56. Uh, one, two, three, four, the fifth, whereas, whereas members have been permitted to construct alterations on previously approved and grandfather. And then two other places. Are you with me on that one? Oh, I see yes. you. Yes, I agree. That's, and there's two more. And the other two are uh, the, the last to resolve further. And one, two, three at the bottom of that says previously approved and grandfathered. Yes. And then the next one down below that also again, previously approved and grandfathered. So there's three places should be. All right. Okay. <clears throat> That's a. Let me see if I have any. No, I said I have one other one, but I'll wait till we get to uh, the payment plan agreement and all that. All okay. right. Uh, may I have a motion, please, to approve the minutes with the uh, Scribner's errors corrected? I make a motion. Okay, Carl, second. Thank you. Okay, you should have your voting screen up. I remind you all we have our wonderful new stylus. Use those to Are we missing Cheryl? Just Elsie. I'm sorry, my screen is a little Okay, just tell me your, just give me your verbal vote. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, Elsie. Okay. 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 All right, it passes uh, basically unanimously, 10 to 9. Okay. Uh, now we come to the report of the chair, and I have quite a bit this morning. Um, first of all, uh, we had a special board meeting on November 29th. It was not televised, but it was an open meeting. We had a few people, but not very many, who came. So I would like to announce the results of that special meeting. The first item of ag on the agenda was we uh, had a <clears throat> presentation by the two candidates for the board to replace Janie Durrell. And then we had the vote, and I am pleased to announce that our new board member is Anthony Libatori. We then had uh, presentations and vote for a uh, appointment to the VMS board, which Anthony was coming off, leaving us with one extra vote. And um, I don't see him here. Uh, Ron Bellner was uh, a appointed, it's not election, appointed to the VMS board for uh, the next three-year term. We also, at that session, approved the committee assignments, and I'd like to talk a little bit about it for our residents. We have two different sets of committees that our board members are required to participate in. That gives us 45 basically places that we need to have filled. The United Committees, of which there are 11, and uh, um, 10, excuse me, and the 10 GRF committees. GRF committees are made up of three GRF directors, two from United, two from Third, and one from the Towers. And if we don't have our people participating, we don't know what happens on those committees, because as you know, we have reports that come back to us. And also, it often means that uh, they are lacking enough people to do their quorum. So it's very important that we have two people, and this time we did two people plus one alternate, in case one of those two people were not able to make the meeting. On the <clears throat> United Board Committees, we have a minimum of 25 directors required to meet the board responsibilities. 
We have 10 committees, and that means 10 chairs, and then a minimum of two board members on each of the committees. It all comes down to about 45 director responsibilities for committees, and that is one of their duties as a director. What we have found, uh, and the way we go about it, first and foremost is, according to our bylaws, the chairs are appointed by the president, which I did. We ask all of our board members to let us know what committees they preferred. We can't always give everybody everything they want. We have to fill all the committees. So we then went over that, and we have what we think of as our executive council, third calls it committee, and that is the five officers that are elected by our board members at the organizational meeting in October. And so we got together and worked out the committee assignments so that uh, we would uh, incorporate everybody and um, Director <coughs> Randossa did a wonderful uh, Excel spreadsheet where everybody was, what they were for both GRF and United committees. Now we ran into some problems because we had a few directors who decided they could not be on the number of committees they were put on. One specified he would do one committee only. Another one said two and another one said three, that they just didn't have time to do the other committees. This meant that the rest of the board had to take up the slack. And so uh, it's a very difficult thing to ask the rest of the board members to, to do your duty, but that's the way it came up. No, you can't. I'm not at all. No, not at this. Uh, I believe what he was going to say, we did have one member who said, I'll, I'll be on all of them, I'll be on any of them, and that's not the way the board works. You've got to have it divided up. Um, anyway, we did work out the chart. We do have our committees in place. And I uh, look forward to having a good year with the committees that we have in place. Now, there are, particularly with, um, I want to emphasize it was a group decision. It was not my decision. Um, <clears throat> and as to the GRF committees, they are chaired by a GRF member. And if there is a problem that they feel that one of our delegates to that committee is not contributing to the committee or is an obstruction, they can ask us to remove that person from the committee and appoint somebody else. We hope that's not going to happen this year. Secondly, <clears throat> all of you got one of these in the last couple weeks, a nice white envelope from uh, United Laguna Woods. And I'd like to take just a minute to talk about what's in there, because I know too many people who just kind of maybe look at the front sheet and see what the uh, assessment's going to be for the, com for the coming year, and it breaks it down as to 2018 and 2018 and 2019 and the differences and that kind of thing. So they look at this, and then they throw the rest away, or they stick it in a drawer and think, I'll do it later. I wanted to point out that only the first part of it is a budget report, and this is, re is required by law twice a year. We send one out in November, and we send another one out in April after the audit is done. But the second part, if you go into your packet a little deeper, you find things <coughs> like um, disciplinary process. We have a number of people who come up uh, for disciplinary action who said, I had no idea. I didn't know this was against the rules. I didn't know how it was handled, all of this. So we put that in this packet so it's, you, you are fully informed. And that includes a schedule of the monetary payments that you may be assessed at a disciplinary hearing, the traffic monetary penalties if you are brought into our traffic hearings. It also has our collection and lien policy. And there are many times when uh, People are way back in their assessments, and we have a standard policy as to when we put a lien on a unit. Remember, United owns all those units. People just buy a right to occupy. But if they don't pay their assessments, we can take that unit back. That whole policy on lien enforcement, 
assessments and foreclosures is all in here. And all of you as United members need to be aware of what it is. Uh, <clears throat> we have a, a dispute resolution and request form if you don't agree with something that uh, uh, perhaps has been assessed against you, that you have the right, and this is the form for dispute resolution, and you can uh, bring it forward for a meet and confer with the board, many different things. All of those rules are in here. And last but certainly not least are the three things at the end of the packet that are called other enclosures. Please look at the back of your packet. First and foremost, we have the code red system. Code red is if we can't reach you, we can't notify you. We are a very, very large community. And disasters are not just a major earthquake that does the whole village. It can be, <coughs> as we have had twice in the last year, an active shooter event. And we have had to close off a few streets. The sheriff has closed off a few streets, access, that kind of thing. If you are signed up for Code Red, and that means that you have filled out this uh, form, then you will be notified by text, by phone call, by email, whatever we can to let you know what's going on and when it will be open and what's closed and what's not. Uh, <clears throat> I think the thing that was most uh, uh, poignant for me was we had an incident down by Clubhouse 3, and Gate 3 was closed. You couldn't go in or out of it. And I had a couple of residents that called me and said, I don't know how to get to my unit. I always come, out, get, come in and out Gate 3, and I don't know any other way to get there. Now, Gate 3 is more isolated. You have to go all the way down Moulton and El Toro and come in Gate 1 and go down Sevilla in order to get into that area. But they didn't know. So uh, it's, it's important, too, that you be aware of the map of where you are and how you get in and out. So one of them was the code red. Please fill that out. You can leave it at the uh, reception desk or mail it to us. And the address for that is in your packet as well. Um, the other one is the opt-in, opt-out form. We have a membership list, uh, California Civil Code <clears throat> 5220, states that the member of the association may opt out of sharing his or her name, property address, and mailing address by filling out this form and saying, I don't want it given out to anybody else. Naturally, we have to use it internally. But that means when somebody contacts us and says, I want a copy of your mailing list, your name and address and phone number are not going to be on there. It's just like the phone book. If you don't want your phone number and address and name in the phone book, you can tell them no. So the opt out form is important too, if you are concerned with that. And last but certainly not least, everybody, when they come into the village, fills out this um, contact information emergency notification form. It's similar to Code Red, but different. And so a lot of people have told me, I filled these out when I moved in. So did I. But you know what? Over a number of years, some things change. Your emergency contacts may have changed. They've moved out of state. They're not your contacts anymore. Or they've gotten a new cell phone and emergency number on it. Uh, there's lots of changes that go on constantly. And so these need to be updated every year, even if it's, you think it's the same information. Fill this out, turn it in, so that we can be sure what we have in our system is the latest information about you so that we can contact you. And that only comes out in November. And so I just wanted to point out to all of you, don't throw that packet away. At least look through the uh, uh, directory and see what's in there and what you might be interested in. And maybe not all at once, but try to review it. But first and foremost, fill out those three things that are at the very back of the packet. I think that's enough for my chair's comments right now. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we have our open forum. I and no, my comments do not generate 
speakers. All right. <coughs> the um, number seven, the open forum. This is three minutes. Any member may address the board. I hope you have filled out a form and given it to our corporate secretary, and we will call you up by name. You have three minutes. Time limit, and there's a timer on the uh, lectern. And this should only be about things that pertain to United. If it's a question of something that basically is uh, um, handled by GRF, then it needs to go to their board, not to our board. So uh, who's our first speaker, please, Madam Secretary? Our first speaker is Chris Collins. Good morning, 3306Q. Um, I'm here representing the foundation of Laguna Woods Village, and um, I want to give you another little update. So what your don donation can buy? You may have that question. Donations to the foundation of Laguna Woods Village make a difference in the lives of needier residents. Through these donations, the foundation has been able to expand the types of assistance that's available to residents via new working relationships with other local service agencies. Today, the foundation has partnerships with AgeWell Senior Services, the Braille Institute, Alzheimer's Orange County, South County Outreach, and the Disaster Preparedness Task Force. Many donors are curious as to how these relationships work and how their donations help needier residents. So for example, a $100 donation can buy two earthquake kits for residents who can't afford them, or two trips to the South County Outreach Food Pantry, transporting approximately eight residents once a month. Both services are arranged by contacting social services at 949-597-4267. A $200 donation can fund approximately five days of uh, daycare at South County Adult Services, which is located on El Toro, and it's provided by Alzheimer's Orange County, or a magnifier and special lighting for a visually impaired resident by the Braille Institute. A $300 donation can, find, can fund 42 meals on wheels or a medical alert system for a fall-prone resident. $400 donation can buy eight, can pay for eight electric bills or provide eight $50 gift grocery cards to needy residents. A $500 donation can provide days of, care, of uh, caregiver services after a hospital stay or repair the hearing aid of a resident facing financial challenges. For more information, please go to our website at the foundation of lagunawoodsvillage.org or you can contact the foundation at 949-268-2246 or foundation at comline.com. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carolyn Brins and Susan Ashton. Um, good morning. My name is Carolyn Barons. I'm the owner of Barons Capital Mortgage, and I currently provide financing for condos and broker for the co-op loans in Laguna Woods Village. I've been doing this since 1996 when I was with El Dorado Bank in 2001 with my own company, Barons Capital Mortgage. We are mortgage banks. This is Susan Ashton. She is the regional manager for Plaza Home Mortgage, also a mortgage bank. And we would like to provide financing for the cooperative units in Laguna Woods Village. The, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the open forum is for members to address I is, issues. I have given permission by 895D Mila Pizzo to speak. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Chair, may I have the floor? Certainly. The open forum is for members to address the board on issues concerning their membership in the community, not for commercial or marketing purposes. Well, my question to you is, could you benefit from additional lenders in Laguna Woods for the co-ops? Because a lender of one is no choice at all. 
All right, I think that this is something you need to bring up to our finance committee. It doesn't belong before the board at this time. Okay, and who would the contact person be for that? Our treasurer. Oh, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Can I have your card? I'll give you a... Okay, thank you. Okay. Next. Sure. Our next speaker is Steve uh, Lowell. Morning. Good morning. I'm here to express my displeasure of removing channel three from the TV lineup. Uh, to me, this is simply a money grab, forcing people to go and buy a box or pay rent for a box, which is four bucks or whatever it is, so I can see what's on the TV. Uh, I'm not willing to buy a box, rent a box. It's another piece of junk made somewhere in China that will end up in a trash heap in time. Okay. My TV is perfectly good. May I interrupt you, please, to let you know that that is a GRF function. It is not something controlled or done by United. So I suggest you go. There's a media communications committee meeting for... Uh, and they told me to come here. No, no, no. <laughs> yes. Who told so, you to come here? A media communication. No, it's not a United no. issue. Okay, well, at least you should know about it. It would, okay. it would be Thank GRF. You. It's GRF. Then if the committee could not help you, perhaps you would like to go to the GRF board meeting. But it's nothing that the United board has any control over. Thank, Thank you. Much. Otherwise, you are doing a good job. That's why I'm not feeling Okay. Okay, our next speaker is Esther Wright. Good morning, and happy holidays. Good morning, Esther. <laughs> so, first of all, I'm pleased to let you know, if you haven't already heard, that the Laguna Woods City Council recently voted to ban the use of Roundup in the city of Laguna Woods, and we realized that Laguna Woods Village is not under the jurisdiction of the council, but we thought it was important for you to acknowledge that the city council has banned Roundup in the city of Laguna Woods outside of Laguna Woods Village. And then I have a couple of questions. And what I wish was possible is for people from the Non-Toxic Neighborhood Association to address you about these issues. But, uh, but since residents and members are the only people allowed to uh, speak with you, I need to uh, ask some questions, and specifically to Maggie Blackwell. Related to the uh, November freeze, there was a landscape um, committee report. And as some of you know, I'm not here just representing myself. I'm one member, but there are almost a thousand people that have called upon us, Lois and I, to represent them in the non-toxic Laguna Woods project. And I'm also representing the hundreds of people who have shown up at meetings that we've called in the last six months. So. In the um, Village Breeze, there's a United Landscape Committee report, and it has a paragraph that I'm very concerned about. And I, I don't know if Bruce Hartley gave this information to Maggie or whether Maggie got this information from other places, but I'm very concerned about this particular paragraph because it was distributed to people throughout Laguna Woods Village. So I just want to go over it very quickly and ask you, first of all, to listen to the tone of this paragraph and to also question the accuracy of the information in the paragraph. So it says, in 2015, 16, and 17, United tested two organics which proved ineffective. If history repeats itself and we give up Roundup, hand weeding will be needed. I don't know where this idea came from that hand weeding is the only alternative to, uh, to the issue of giving up Roundup. We will need one to two additional work crews of eight workers plus supervisors for weeding which is $600,000 per crew yearly. Again, I wish Bruce Hartley was here or someone was here that could justify and explain th this information. Assessments could increase $8 to $16 per month. Be aware that of 482 municipalities in California, fewer than five, including Nevada and Benicia, have completely banned Roundup. Nevada is seeking resident volunteers to weed city property. Probably not a choice for Laguna Woods Village unless we recruit volunteers from some of the athletic groups, which I think is actually a, a sarcastic comment. But here's the deal. This paragraph is negative. It does not 
contain any possibility that eliminating Roundup would be a good thing for this community. We have submitted evidence to all the boards demonstrating that Roundup is carcinogenic and unhealthy for the residents of this community. We have met with hundreds of residents. We turned in, you know, almost 1,000 signatures. <clears throat> and this particular paragraph needs to be asked. We need to question the, the facts. And because people who are not members or owners are not allowed to be here, we can't have the people who are the experts come and speak to you about these facts. All right, but they your, are your time is accurate. up, Esther, and Thank I would you. just like to remind you yes. that this Thursday, 9 o'clock yes. in this room, yes. our Landscape Committee and the uh, Bruce and the, the landscape people in VMS will be here giving a complete report I, I, on the 100-day trial that we had, yes. why, what happened, what the uh, results are, and that kind of thing. So I Thank you. Thank you for reminding me and, and the viewers about <clears throat> December 13th. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. We're looking forward to that meeting. Okay. Our next speaker is Patricia Bloomgreen. Good morning. Um, I'm not sure about what this is about. Um, new business, C, your enter motion to adopt the payment plan agreement. Yes. Now, if you're, you're just speaking on that, you should wait until that um, item okay, comes up sorry. on the agenda. Thank you. These are public forum is items that are not on the agenda. Okay. Okay, our next speaker is Rick Stevens. Good morning. Uh, we need better designed laundry rooms. Our laundry rooms are in dire need of updating with proper equipment that is raised. Current equipment is in inadequate, causing laundry users to squat, bend, and fling laundry over doors that open in the wrong direction. I've heard other residents complain of, of the low front loading machines. I heard every time I do laundry, and I need a day or more for recover, recovery. United is charging residents to use laundry room equipment, and United should pro provide equipment comparable to other pay retail laundry establishments that does not hurt our residents now or in the future. Reconfiguring laundry room equipment should be treated as an emergency and done quickly regardless of cost. All of our other facilities look and are top rate where our public laundry rooms look 1960s dated. From my understanding, most of our other grand up-to-date facilities like golf, swimming, and so, so on are subsidized. Every laundry facility that I have been involved with is <coughs> profit I've center. seen this a couple times. Tra charging a dollar to wash and a dollar to dry will or should turn our laundry room into profit center. Res residents in my neighborhood that use the public laundry facilities do not have room inside their own residence, haven't remodeled, or can't afford to pay $2 to wash and dry. Most of the residents in my neighborhood are too old or don't care to take advantage of the other offerings in Laguna Woods, but need to do laundry. Some residents cannot afford to pay the dollar to wash, so they wash small loads at home <coughs> and use the free public dryers, interrupting residents that are paying to wash. The updated drawing on my handout is the bare minimum <clears throat> updating required. Our laundry room should be updated like all of our other buildings. We should have modern retail stacked equipment that will provide more than the seven machines that we currently have in our laundry room. <clears throat> in my opinion, a modest 50 cents to wash and a 50 cents to dry would be appropriate. Because I want to see all my neighbors able to wash, dry, and walk around in clean clothes. <clears throat> I have a few experiences with the trash pickers that seem to work if you extend my time when I'm done talking about the laundry room. The other issue I have to deal with is, I don't know if any people have been hacked in your computer equipment at home, but I'm currently being hacked now. I would have printed out some nicer handouts, but I can't do it because they're hacking my equipment. <clears throat> uh, we need more than seven machines. The machines we have in there now, we have four washing machines and three dryers. It should be the other way around. 
you should have four dryers and three washing machines. And then you can see by my handout, the door should be configured so people don't have to squat and sling stuff over the doors that open the wrong direction. As far as the trash pickers go, what's worked for me, and I see these guys picking through the trash, stealing our valuable recyclables. I've gone out there and I say, hey, you know, this is an old establishment with old people. Old people get sick. I said, you're digging through trash that most likely every week somebody's throwing away trash and they're sick. I said, is it worth it to you just to get sick once? And <clears throat> I've not seen those fellows come back. I think we should make up a sign that kind of uh, either uh, explains that fact to people. Um, I've only been able to talk to a few of these guys. I haven't been well myself the last few years, but... I think education would be a key thing in keeping these pickers from coming around, and it's a cheap alternative. If the educational <coughs> uh, part of it fails, I would suggest we put uh, video cameras on there to monitor who goes to the trash bin, and then security will probably only have to watch it for a month or so, and uh, when they see the uh, people picking the trash, to send security out. And I'm sorry, sir, your time is up. Okay, well, I have to spend my time for the trash pickers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our last speaker is Maxine McIntosh. Sir, we will be answering these questions when these are over. Uh, I suggest you stay. Uh, Maxine is our last speaker. Ah, okay. Three minutes is all then. <laughs> Maxie, welcome. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. I think uh, all of us here know that uh, any time during the daytime you take a walk in United, it's beautiful. You don't have to be down at the park, which is especially beautiful. You don't have to walk along Serpentine Walk, which is gorgeous. You can walk anywhere. People tell me all the time it's wonderful for walking entirely throughout the village. But how many of us do it after dark? Last night I took a long walk around 6 o'clock. It's exciting. You should see the way people are decorating who like to decorate for holidays. You know, a lot of the decorations do not show from the street because all the units aren't positioned that way. And I saw a number of people now using these, uh, what are they called, the, the uh, outboard kaleidoscope type uh, motors. It's just a unit this big, but it projects all these big uh, display of, displays of lights uh, on a wall on the front of the unit. One woman had it on a tree because behind the tree there was not another manor, there was just a hill. So she had the tree looking like little fairies were creeping up all the branches in different colors. It was beautiful. A number of people are very clever the way they avoid getting out the step ladder anymore. At my house we don't do that anymore. Or a step stool. Some of them have uh, used the services of their handyman, handyman or men to install lights on their patios or to put up their Christmas tree for them. And uh, one lady was so creative, I hadn't met her before, we chatted, and uh, she was over by uh, gate two. And she invited me into her house because I complimented her on a hanging plant in her patio. A, a basket, you know, not a very big one, about this big. And she had these little tiny lights. She called them fairy lights. And they're twinkling off and on. I thought, well, isn't that, you know, really special for such a small item? And she said, come in my house. And she was using what she calls fairy lights in many different places, uh, on this bouquet, around this poinsettia, and so forth. And she said she ordered them all through, uh, I think it's called QVC, something like that, on television, to get those, uh, those battery-operated fairy lights. But uh, consider getting out and uh, taking a stroll, seeing what there is out there. Some of it is very elaborate, some of it is very simple. I'm so proud of people that take the trouble to express their joy in this time of year. Take a flashlight, because we have a lot of big trees now that cut out the moonlight. You may be going in an area that's a little bit dark. Our lights are directional lights, not really illumination lights, so it's good to have a flashlight. Happy holidays to all of you. Thank you, Maxine. <coughs> all right. Uh, we will have <coughs> a response to member comments. Um, <coughs> Maxine, do you have anything that you want to say except that you have your meeting on Thursday? Yeah, I can 
Maggie. What did I say? Maggie. Maxine. Gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you. There are negatives on both sides of the Roundup issue. Surely Roundup itself is a negative, and that has been put out by this group of people notifying others and getting people to sign the petition. There's almost nothing positive to say about Roundup, and we all know that. But on our side, if we look at the financial and the practical problems, there are negatives. So it will be our turn at the committee meeting on Thursday to go over these reports and these tests and weigh and see what we will recommend to the board if we do recommend something. Because there is no doubt that more labor will be needed. No one questions that. And that is a negative. That means more labor means more costs for United. And so we will discuss this thoroughly on Thursday. I appreciate your comments. We all appreciate your concern. But we have to see what we can do. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Gary? As a follow-up to that, and I want everyone to know, I don't care one way or the other what we do, but we need to get the facts out there. And Bruce Hartley has uh, given us a cost, or the cost of increase of, of uh, not using Roundup, which is going to average about $6.70 a month. Now we have not budgeted for this for 2019, which means we'll have to use money pulled from something else and then replace it next year, which means we're going to have to increase everyone's monthlies to about $13. So it's like I said, I don't care, but I want people to know what it's gonna cost, and um, I just know how people reacted when we wanted to increase golf fees or the uh, renting of rooms or whatever, and that was only a couple dollars, and they just went crazy. So I am concerned about what $13 a month might do. Thank you. All right, again, let's not make any decisions until after we hear a report on Thursday. <clears throat> Director Armendariz. Thank you, Anita. I, I, I'll just make this real brief. I think the report that you're going to hear on uh, Thursday uh, you will receive is very positive. And I, I'm not sure where Gary got his numbers, but in the report, <laughs> you uh, the number that they're talking about, they do have an effective alternative. And the increased cost over what's already been budgeted is 405000 which works out to be just a little over $5 per month. So I think it's doable. That's all I want to say at this point. Let's wait till Thursday, and we'll go through the whole thing. Thank you. Anybody interested in the pesticide uh, test and all that we've done with landscape, we invite you to come to this room, the boardroom, 9 o'clock on Thursday, and hear the whole report. A lot of work has gone into this, both by staff and by the committee. So uh, it's worth your while to uh, come and see what it is. <clears throat> Director Randosa. I'd like to uh, comment on Steve Ola's even though it has nothing to do with us, but I have some information on that as a public service announcement, and i also like to comment on the laundry room. Uh, as a public service announcement, my neighbor has a HDTV. She does not have a box. She was having a problem trying to get Channel 3 after the Channel 3 went off the air. We found out that as soon as you go into auto, uh, you go into an automatic program mode, and you wait your 20 your minutes or a half an hour and get the, pro, get the channels all now squared up with what we have as far as digital, if you have a digital TV, that is. If you have an analog TV, I can't even talk to that. But if you have a digital TV, you'll probably find that channel three is no longer there 
but a channel at the higher end, either 128, 129, or 130, because she needed the channel 3 TV channel also, and it's now either at 128, 129, or 130. I forget what the number is. So if you go to the higher ends, after you do an auto, check, auto program, you'll get that. It's a public service announcement. With regard to the uh, laundry rooms, uh, I'm a bit perplexed because we have, uh, you said that it costs $2, but I believe that the washing machines are the only thing we charge right now and the dryers we do not charge for, so it's only like a dollar per load. Charges, Is that correct? Right. Yes. So at this particular point in time, so what you're saying is that some people cannot afford a dollar. I know that if they went out to a laundromat, it would probably be a heck of a lot more expensive than a dollar. The other thing right now is any laundromats that I've been in, and I haven't been in, I used to live in Texas, and in Texas we had laundromats also, and they call them washeterias back in Texas. Uh, <clears throat> they, uh, we had low, we did not have the uh, front loaders because front loaders are the industrial type. That's why they have those type of machines. And they use the least amount of water. That's the reason why we use the front loaders also. They did not have them on top of platforms. They had them low to the ground. Now, yes, you have to bend over, but I don't know what I can tell about that. At this particular point in time, we have no intentions of putting these things on platforms because of the fact that then we would have to make sure that they're stabilized, and there's a whole thing that goes on with that. So at this particular point in time, uh, it is somewhat of an inconvenience to bend over. That is true. I don't know what I can say about that. And with regard to the numbers of washing machines and dryers, uh, based on a previous member of the board who did study with VMS regarding this, they determined that many of our washers and dryers in certain sections of the village are not really used. And the numbers of washers and dryers in each of the laundry room is checked every once in a while to determine whether or not it's sufficient because they find out how many people are actually using these things. So uh, I don't know what else I can say. It is an inconvenience to bend over. And we could possibly go with a dollar for a wash and a dollar for a dry, but then they'll be up in arms over the fact that we're charging $2 per load rather than $1 per load. And you're right, some people actually do hand washing in their unit and then they go out there and use the dryers. And unless you have a policeman out there to make sure that you know you, everything is on the up and up, I don't know how else to address that. So I'm sorry that there's an inconvenience here, but uh, we can check it with VMS and see what else can be done. But I believe right now the numbers that are in these little laundry rooms are consistent with their usage. And if you know that there's something different, please let us know. And you know, if you have any information on that. I'm sorry, there's no, it's not a dialogue. Uh, <clears throat> so not at this time. I would like to speak to your uh, <clears throat> issue with the uh, trash pickers. This board passed a resolution two months ago mm -hmm. uh, forbidding that. You cannot go into our trash containers, which are owned by waste management, uh, period. So if you see people doing that, call security. It is a violation of all of our rules. We do have some signs up. I don't know that they're on everything. I know they are on my two trash cans, uh, bins. Um, and the cost to put uh, cameras up there is prohibitive for a community as large as we have, as many trash bins as we have. But if you personally see somebody doing it, call security. Yeah, they, they leave, they leave mm -hmm. Well, if they're on, are they on a bicycle? Are they in a car? Can you get a license plate? Anyway, that's all I can say is it is illegal in this village. Right. Well, that's true. All right, that's it's not a dialogue. Sorry. All right, uh, Director Tarn, you wanted to make a comment. Yes, uh, I was going to talk about uh, uh, Channel Three. Actually, you can find it in I think 129 somewhere there. 
uh, I was surprised to see that uh, Channel 3 was gone, but then as I set up auto setups and everything brought back, and I can go through that, I can see that 129 channels, so that is indeed there. I believe and that's what, Dr. what Director Randosa said. Yes, I confirmed that. Right. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, uh, as far as Ethers uh, uh, talk about uh, the breeze uh, argument, uh, topic about uh, uh, alternate Alternative is not very effective, and handwork required. Uh, I think this uh, uh, this board is uh, uh, it's probably best to talk in the landscape committee meeting, and you are uh, you, you are aware of uh, when it will happen. And during that report, uh, hopefully, we will publish a little bit earlier for, uh, or at least give uh, us a copy of that to talk to you know research on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Director Ryan Margolis. <laughs> I'd like to comment on the uh, washers. There are stands provided by the makers of the washers, and we probably should look into it. Also, it's very difficult to get from the dryer over the door, and we might want to look at removing them around because we do have electrical connections. But unfortunately, the water connections are always going to be a problem if we try to move things around. But I do know that the washer makers do provide stands, and they are not very costly. So we may need to look into that through the maintenance and construction committee. Right. That's why we turned it over to Carl. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, I don't have any other speakers, so I missed it. you didn't press request to speak. Uh, I just want to add to what Andre and uh, Carl had to say about Channel 3. Uh, I found out the same thing they did. And I was planning to go upstairs and wherever it is and tell them they put out a list of the channels that are available. And if, if it's not on this particular number, then it's got an alternative number. So I was planning to go up there and suggest they update that <coughs> regarding channel three. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And on the laundry rooms, I think Sue made a good suggestion there. You know, if it can be done, that would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, <clears throat> next we have an update from VMS, Director Stone. And I'd just like to make clear before Mary starts, VMS directors are appointed, we have three from United, and there are three from GRF and three from Third Mutual. They are an extended part of our board team. They are our liaison to VMS. We work very closely together, and so it's really important that we let the residents out there know uh, what's happening in VMS, and that's what Mary's going to do this morning. <clears throat> Good morning, directors. Happy to be here before the holiday season. I wish you all happy holidays. I have a slide presentation. Cheryl, can we? It's up on ours. Is it up? <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm looking at... Okay. Um, this is the organization chart that I showed you the last time I was here, and it shows the upper management levels. And every organization has some form of hierarchy framework. The levels within the framework determine how the business operates and how decisions are made and distributed throughout the hierarchy. The major benefit of having well-defined business roles is the development of clear objectives and a tight organizational structure. When one level of the hierarchy makes a decision and instructs the next level, objectives are clear and things tend to get done efficiently. Board members are an oversight system with some controlling power. They pass along shareholder input and give direction to the CEO and primary decision makers. The CEO runs the entire show and makes the big decisions based on the organization's direction and actions, and the COO runs everything in terms of operations and processes. Today, I'd like to talk about our operations level. Next slide, please. So this is the operations, and we have division heads that oversee their departments. They work as intermediaries for middle income and upper level management to communicate and ensure their departments are meeting performance standards. 
VMS has 17 managers and 40 supervisor, supervisor positions. Next, please. The total number of positions held by VMS employees the first week in December was 899. 55 were full-time employees and 287 were part-time. Ordinarily, you see full-time equivalent statistics. These are actual positions. Next, please. This chart shows the ratio of part-time positions by division. As you can see, VMS has a large percentage of part-time positions in security, recreation, and general services. These are generally held by, or not always, but are held mostly by resident employees. Let's look at security next. Security has 212 positions, 169 of which were part-time and 152 of, of those were gate ambassadors. Recently, four positions in social services was transferred to security along with the compliance department. Recreation services has 126 positions and 93 are primarily in the clubhouses golf operations, and fitness centers. <coughs> Moving on to maintenance and construction. Maintenance and construction has a total of 177 employees. The departments with the largest number of employees are painting, that's 44, carpentry, 39, plumbing, 22. The handyman service has only <coughs> two. Landscape Services is responsible for managing, organizing, planning, and coordinating all landscape operations. It has 165 positions in 10 departments. Grounds Maintenance tops the list with the most positions, 85. <coughs> general Services. This slide shows the number of positions in the six departments of General Services for a total of 106 positions. Transportation has 36 employees, and 19 of those are part-time bus drivers. And there are 37 janitors taking care of GRF and mutual property. Resident Services has 33 employees for three departments. Their duties include maintaining official corporate membership and occupancy records, processing all membership changes through transfers, leases, and resales, and 22 customer service representatives receive, organize, and process resident services requests. In the third quarter, almost 18,600 residential services requests were, were handled. Okay. Financial services has 19 employees responsible for administration, accounting, budget and financial planning, risk management and insurance, payroll and collection, among other things. Mail and copy services, purchasing and contracts and warehouse departments are being transferred to financial services from general services, bringing the total in financial services to 30. Information services has a staff of 29, including two part-time employees. <coughs> They are responsible for network operations, software development, and support, data entry, broadband services, and TV operations. Chuck Holland gave his department update at our last DMS meeting and highlighted the 2018 achievements and 2019 goals for information technology and broadband. This is where I can only say it was awesome, in the true sense of the word. We've come a long way in the last couple of years, and there's more on the slate for next year. Moving on to human resources, please. Thank you. Human resources is a small division of 10 that has the responsibility for everything to do with almost 900 employees retained by VMS. This year, the department had, added, had the added burden of using a new software system, Dayforce. Key functional areas include benefits administration, labor and employee relations, legal and governmental compliance, safety and environmental implementation, recruitment and training, and workers' compensation. And I have special thanks 
to Carrie and Gabby for getting me the statistics for this presentation. Finally, we have the CEO's office. This last side, slide is to recognize the hard work of the seven employees in the office of the CEO. Their key functional areas are governance and, public, and broad, excuse me, governance and board relations, legal and governmental liaison, communication, public relations, and marketing. As directors, we work closely with this office for most of our information. In closing, I would like to emphasize the importance of the chain of responsibility and communications. Directors are responsible for making policy decisions and leaving operations to staff. When one level of the hierarchy makes a decision and instructs the next level, objectives are clear and, and things tend to get done effective effectively. So please review the communication protocol that has handed, been given to the directors. BMS is very proud of its staff, and our goal is to continue improving in every department. The next meeting of BMS will be December the 19th in the Willow Room. It is the annual membership meeting for board directors only, and I do hope you will all attend. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mary. Very nice presentation. Lots of good information. All right, uh, our next item is a report. Uh, Carl. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, reports do not have questions. Thank you. Oh, it wasn't a question. Comment? Later. Can we make sure that we include that in the minutes? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, it will be included in the minutes. Yeah. Okay, uh, our next uh, <clears throat> item is uh, <clears throat> the CEO report. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Thank you, President and members of the board. I was going to lead off this morning by encouraging our residents to fill out the code red forms that were sent out in your budget packets, but our president already covered that. Again, these forms can be dropped off at the community center to the concierge desk, mailed in to the community center, or completed online at lagunawoodsvillage.com. Again, we encourage everyone to fill out these forms and stay in touch with us in times of emergency. For village holiday hours, I want to point out that Monday, December 24th, Tuesday, December 25th, and Tuesday, January 1st are considered VMS holidays. And as such, contractors are not allowed to work in the village on these days. On Monday, December 24th, transportation will only have planner ride available. And so if you need to schedule a planner ride, please do so before noon on Saturday, December 22nd. And this can be done by calling 949-597-4659 or emailing ride at vmsinc.org. Resident services walk-in center will be closed on December 24th, but the call center will be operating from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And as a reminder, the number for resident services is 949-597-4600. On Tuesday, December 25th and Tuesday, January 1st, there will be no transportation services available and resident services will be closed. I want to remind everyone that reservations are being taken for the two New Year's Eve events that are coming up. The first is the rocking New Year's Eve dinner dance at Clubhouse 5 on Monday, December 31st. This features music by Salicious, a Motown tribute band. The doors for this event open at 6.30, dinner is served at 7.15, and the music starts at 8 o'clock. There will be a ball drop at both 9 p.m. and midnight. Mm -hmm. Complimentary champagne will be served, and tickets are being sold at Clubhouse 5. The second New Year's event is a special performance by the James Darren Band featuring uh, Dave Siebels, and this will be occurring at the Performing Arts Center. James Darren is known for playing Moondoggy in the original Gidget. Also, more recently, the character of Vic Fontaine in Star Trek Deep Nine. Show times are at 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. And tickets are available at the Performing Arts Center box office. This morning, I also wanted to provide an update on the Shepherd Crook <coughs> fencing project. Some residents have noticed that there are a few gaps between sections of the newly installed Shepherd's Crook. The reason for this is that some of the walls require custom work 
in terms of uh, fabricating the shepherd's crooks. These are in progress and will be installed as soon as possible. In the meantime, the open <laughs> gaps have been secured. So please look for that project to finish soon. I'm also happy to report that our senior transportation and maintenance manager started work yesterday. His name is Chris Lognor, and he holds a Bachelor's of Science in Public Affairs from the University of Southern California and a Master's degree in Public Administration from California State Long Beach. He has more than 30 years of extensive experience with the city of Santa Ana, including the areas of transportation, fleet management, contract administration, and budget management, most recently managing the $120 million police department budget in Santa Ana. Chris will be overseeing our transportation service, vehicle maintenance, streets and sidewalks, custodial services, and also manage the solid waste contract. One more person I'd like to welcome to the village is a new social worker in social services. Dustin Arbuckle comes to us from Saddleback Medical Center serving as a social worker liaison between our social services department and Saddleback Medical Center. The position is provided by Saddleback at minimal cost to our community. Dustin has a master's degree in social work from the University of Southern California and also a master's degree in theological studies from Vanderbilt University. Dustin will create continuity of care for residents who have recently been released from Saddleback Hospital as well as developing and implementing presentations designed to address large-scale issues affecting our community. So please join me in welcoming both these new employees to our community, and we will make sure they're introduced at a future board meeting so you have a familiarity with them. And lastly, I just want to mention that security enhancements are coming to the community center. They will be taking or being implemented in January, and further details will be forthcoming to the board. That concludes my presentation this morning. Thank you, Siobhan. <clears throat> All right, the next item on the agenda is our uh, consent calendar. We only have one item on the consent calendar uh, this month, uh, and that is a approval of a resolution to record a lien. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? All right, Carl, is there a second? I'll second. All right. Any questions or comments on the consent calendar? Hearing none, it's uh, approved without objection. Okay. <clears throat> we have nothing on the unfinished business, and I would just like to comment that uh, you will see the things that we talked about last month on the future agenda items, which is number 16. 16. And those are the things that we uh, had first reading for and uh, postponed because of the state law for 30-day uh, member notification, which starting next month will only be 28 days. Thank you. Uh, but those will show up on the future agenda items, so there's nothing today. Uh, moving on to uh, item 13, <clears throat> new business. The first one, A, uh, is a supplemental application. Would you read that <clears throat> resolution for us, please, Madam Secretary? Uh, here we go. All right, supplemental application. Appropriation for full reserve study. A reserve study is a budget planning tool that identifies components for which United Mutual is responsible to maintain or replace, which is updated annually by on-site staff and relies on a collection of field observations and financial reports that combine into a stable and equitable 30-year funding plan that provides for the timely execution of the association's major repair and replacement expenses. 
And whereas at the November 27, 2018 United Finance Committee meeting, staff reviewed methodologies used to prepare the current reserve study and recommended retaining a reserve specialist to prepare a fully reserve a full reserve study with a draft available for upcoming budget meetings that start in the second quarter of 2019. It has been a couple of years since we've had one, so it's an appropriate time to do it. Now, therefore, be it resolved on December 11, 2018, the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby approves a supplemental appropriation of $40,000 to be funded from the reserve fund to perform a full reserve study for use in the 2020 business planning process. And of course, the officers and agents of this corporation are authorized to carry this resolution out. I move this resolution. All right, this does not require the 30-day uh, hold. So uh, I have a motion <coughs> to approve this uh, supplemental appropriation. Do I have a second? All right, uh, <coughs> Director Armendariz. All right, any uh, dis discussion? Seeing none. Hey, just oh, okay. I'm sorry. It went right to the uh, voting screen. <clears throat> All right, uh, Director Chong. Uh, during our recent uh, reserve study analysis, both by uh, Director uh, Manuel Armadillo-Ferris and uh, uh, I. We've identified a few issues that we cannot recreate the budget numbers that uh, provide to us, and we don't know why. Why are the budget numbers are like that? And we try to follow the guidelines provided to us, and we couldn't uh, uh, recreate that. So that was a big problem, and that's the reason some of us voted no on the uh, budget. Uh, however, it's get passed anyway. Uh, so my question, uh, the biggest concern I have is that uh, and the board decided that we, pro we need a new reserve study to start over again and identify what is the, uh, the, tr the right uh, budget number and the reserve study provided us the right budget number. Uh, that's the history of it. So at this point, uh, the question we, uh, additional, in addition to a good restart, we are also questioning what is the procedure for future updates if the future updates, uh, we, we still haven't got any feedback as far as how are these uh, reserves updated year to year, and we had some questions uh, why these numbers are reached that uh, level. So we are asking for that. I hope the reserve study, first I want to know if we have that uh, uh, reserve study procedure. Second, I want to know is the uh, reserve study, this reserve study will study and identify what is the update procedure because once this, we don't want to uh, do a, a reserve study every year, we want to follow the uh, standard update procedure and provide us the information. Thank you very much. So we can verify, justify the number for the residents. <coughs> thank you. All right, thank you for your input. Uh, we will we, now vote. We have another request to speak oh, from okay. Mary Stone. <coughs> Mary? Mary Stone, 356C. The last reserve study was done in 2007, and I would like to just remind the staff that uh, in your director's room, you will see the business plan for that, the, the results of that study, and what you will find is they will recommend that you be 100% fully funded, and you will see a very significant number, you know, that, you know, we, we can't, we don't want to put that much money into reserves. So be very aware of that. Go look it up before you, you know, get this reserve study taken care of. Thank you, Mary. All right. <clears throat> Director Arangeris. Um. I believe a lot of uh, positives are coming from this. Uh, uh, I do agree with some of Andre's observations in, in that uh, if you look at the report that we get in the Green Book, um, it's pretty obvious that there's not enough disclosure in there 
to really understand how all the numbers are put together. Uh, I believe Betty is going to expand on that uh, in the uh, green book for 2019. And I'm looking forward to seeing that book. And hopefully, we'll get better transparency on how all these numbers are put together. So uh, I look forward to the, receiving the study next year, too. And I hope it won't be too shocking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments? You've already had your chime on this. Okay, uh, <clears throat> would you please vote? I, sorry, I, I, have, uh, I want to amend this resolution. Uh, you already spoke. I want to amend this resolution. Let him make it. All right, what is your amendment? I want to amend this uh, amendment that uh, the reserve study not just uh, initiating a new reserve for us, but also establish a formal uh, standard operating procedure to describe how these updates will be pro uh, performed in the future years. So all the residents, all the board directors will be able to follow how come all these numbers uh, are derived, uh, and if there's any discrepancy, we can uh, further verify. Otherwise, we are in looking at a black box. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Director, I move the uh, <coughs> Director uh, Chang has has uh, put in a, uh, suggested an amendment to the motion that uh, we already have. All those in favor? No, of... we need a second. Oh, we need a second. Is there a second? Seeing none, it will not be amended. So now we will go to the vote of the uh, motion to approve the supplemental appro <coughs> appropriation for the 2019 reserve study. Please use your little stylus and uh, vote. All right, the vote is nine to one, so the motion passes and we will <coughs> do the reserve study. Uh, <clears throat> under new business, the second item, 13B, is to adopt a revised payment plan agreement form and introduce a resolution for a payment plan fee policy for assessments. <clears throat> and this one is just for assessments and does not cover chargeable services. That's the next item in C. Right, so these, read it, please. These are very two similar things. One is if you miss a payment, if you miss a payment, then you need to continue making your regular payments and somehow pay off the missed payment. And that's what this resolution is about. And this is for your assessments. Uh, it is not for... The, the next one is for any other fees and, and charges you have. But this is for simply for a missed payment which must be made up while you are still paying the regular payments. Okay, this is for a member who is unable to timely pay regular assessments is entitled to make a written request for a payment plan to the board. Each request is approved or denied on a case-by-case -case basis by the Finance Committee. A delinquent assessment plan payment form uh, includes several payments and options. It's used to create an agreement between the delinquent member and the mutual. So you need agreement for this. Uh, the United Committee re recommends a revised payment plan agreement form with changes submitted by legal counsel to help reinforce collection activity that will occur if a member breaches the agreed payment plan for delinquent assessments. Whereas the Finance Committee recommends recovering costs associated with accepting payments over time, including the initiation of interest charges and an administrative fee for every month, the agreement is effect. Uh, now, therefore, be it resolved, the corporation hereby int introduces revisions to the delinquent assessment payment plan agreement form as attached to this corporate record, initiating a monthly charge for interest at the rate of 10% per annum. This is on the, the wanting payment. 
and introducing a new payment plan administrative fee of $25 per month. The officers and agents of the corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I move this resolution. Do I have a second? <clears throat> I have a second, but uh, I think we need to discuss a correction that I think the uh, payment plan agreement should have. All right, I have a <clears throat> motion and a second. Um, this is time for uh, discussion, so would you discuss? Okay. Yes, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, payment plan agreement, which is on page two of five, agenda item 13B, uh, in the uh, second paragraph, it says the total amount owed as of the date is so many dollars. It includes assessments, late charges, interest, and collection fees and costs. And then it goes down and, uh, well, I have one recommendation. I don't know if you want to adopt it or not. And I, th I think you should provide a breakdown of what those items are so somebody can see what that amount is made up of. The second, which is of more concern, is that I think uh, any person that is delinquent and has interest accrued against these assessments uh, you should not include interest in here. Uh, you should make whoever the uh, member is pay his interest current, and this should include everything other than interest because I'm assuming the payments, when you arrive at the payment amount, it's going to be like amortizing a loan. And it'll be based on <coughs> six months, seven months, whatever it is, with a 10% interest rate applied to it. And if you include interest in this lump sum amount, you're going to be charging interest on interest. And you're not, allowed, you're not allowed to do that on the civil code. Uh, I looked this up, civil code 5650B-3. Yeah. So I think this needs to be looked at. Uh, take out the word interest, make the condition that they bring all their interest costs current, and then the lump sum that they're financing over whatever number of months that you're gonna amortize at 10% interest does not include interest. So you don't run into that charging interest on interest problem. Do you understand me? Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, that definitely needs to be looked at and corrected. It's a monthly charge. <coughs> All right, Jeff, would you like to respond to this, please? Uh, sure. The, if not, the, we can bring Betty down. Uh, I don't think we need to bring Betty down unless the board needs to speak with her, but the civil code to Manuel's point is correct, which is reflected in your collections policy. Your collections policy is very clear that interest is charged on the delinquent uh, principal assessment, which your um, Betty knows and her staff knows to charge interest just on the principal sum due and not late fees or any other costs. This payment plan should include interest because the payment plan is an agreement between you and the delinquent member to repay those monies due, which includes interest. Um, that's just really how it's done. I'm just talking about the lump sum up here. It's referring to the lump sum including interest. That's the only part I'm talking about not the actual payment plan. Okay, look up there where it says the second, in uh, boldened, the total amount is so many dollars. This includes assessments, late charges, interest. It cannot include interest, because then you would be charging interest on interest. But the, the payment plan agreement is, in a, is a now new contract between you and the delinquent owner, and there has to be an amount stated in the agreement that reflects the total sum due up until the date you're signing that agreement, which has to include interest. If you leave out interest, then there's an argument by all the I'm saying is member that, require them that you're waiving your right to collect the interest. Before you allow this agreement to go into effect. That's what I'm saying. Don't you understand me? I understand, <coughs> I, and, I, and I disagree. Okay. I think this is You're going to be charging interest drafted. on interest, then? No. <clears throat> All right, Director Randaza. <clears throat> is, it, is it not my understanding that the full sum is going to be like when you get a loan, not an amortized loan, a simple interest loan, whereby if you borrow $1,000, okay, your repayment is going to be $1,100 based on 10%. So the $1,100 is what you're paying. Okay, so that divided by 12 would be your monthly payments plus $25 per month. That's the way, so the full amount should be $1,100 that you owe them, 
and the twenty five dollars is is based on the fact of what it is that you uh, your how many months that you're out. I mean, th there's some confusion here. I have to admit. Okay, and maybe we need to get back to committee to basically alleviate some of the confusion. But Director Margolis. I'm concerned about the $25 a month. I think that's a very high fee per month for this. I, where it's a one-time inception. You know what it's going to cost. The main, maintaining this is not going to cost us $25 per month. And we're going for people that are having trouble paying, and we're really hitting them with a big thing. That's, that's a quant, quant, large quantity of money there. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Director Tarn. Thank you for the opportunity to talk, uh, speak about this issue. Uh, my, my concern is about the very first sentence, whereas any member who is unable to timely pay regular assessment, uh, if they are unable to timely pay the regular assessment, how can they afford to pay additional charges? And so it's probably more of a social service issue rather than a, uh, or a foundation issue rather than a board issue. Um, so I'm, I'm asking to, I, I believe what you're trying to say is uh, any member who missed the timely payment rather than unable because uh, if it's enabled, then that's a different issue that, rule, that we can, adding on more charges, not gonna solve it problem. Thank you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> anybody else on the board have a comment? <clears throat> Director Morrison. Yeah, uh, Betty's group, when they put these charges together, they do an actual, uh, estimate, <laughs> actual study, or an estimate of what those charges are going to be. They don't just pull them out of the air. And I don't think it's right for the rest of the village to pay for people that can't afford it. Um, you know, they should have to pay the charges that it's costing, that the rest of us are paying. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, Maggie. Uh, looking at the first line on the pink page, whereas a member, a member who has not paid regular assessment slash S is entitled to make a written request. Member who has not paid regular assessment is entitled to make a written request. That's my suggestion for wording. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> Jeff. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. Um, again, about the uh, interest issue on that um, page two of five, you'll see at the uh, middle of the form, it says initial all that first box paragraph says that the member um, will accrue um, interest at the rate of 10% in accordance with the collection and lien enforcement policy. If you look at the collection and lien enforcement policy, it's very clear that interest can only be charged on the uh, delinquent assessment only. The amount that's subject to this agreement that's gonna be repaid by the member includes any back interest on any unpaid assessments. That amount is not going to accrue interest going forward. Your collection policy doesn't allow that. This captures all the money owed at that date and it allows this person to repay it based on the terms that you agree. And anytime you enter in a payment plan with a member, um, my office does assessment collections. You use ALS, which is a collection agency. My office charges $100 per month to monitor payment plans because there's so much work involved in it. ALS charges a fee per month. I don't know what it is, but I guarantee the $25 doesn't come close to what my office charges or ALS. So there has to be some type of um, compensation to the extra work that's put on staff to monitor these payment plans when they're also at the same time overseeing the normal receivables um, 
that uh, they deal with every day as well. It's a, my, my point is you can waive it if you all agree, but there is a considerable amount of work to process payment plans and to monitor them. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> we have a couple of people from the audience that would like to speak. Yes, Maxine McIntosh. <clears throat> I would hope you could look at this from a little different slant. We never try to compete with outside. We don't charge for golf the way they do in outside golf courses. We don't charge for the laundry use the way they do in the outside. And so when we say, why should we all cover the costs of somebody who's delinquent? Isn't that part of the shared plan? Yes, no. I feel it is because some of these people are delinquent We'll never use lawn bowling, we'll never play tennis, we'll never use the stables, and they're not complaining about paying their share for all of that every month. This is part of the shared cost. I could see a $25 charge to set it up. Once it's in the system, it's not that big a deal. But to charge every month someone who's having trouble struggling to keep up with their payments seems like undue punishment. Remember, oh, our assessments is a shared cost for everything that was originally there. And more and more, things are being pulled out of the assessments and charged to individuals individually. And people say, well, I shouldn't have to pay what he does here. I shouldn't have to pay for the uh, use of the laundry room. I don't use it, and so forth. That's part of the shared cost. We're all, we all knew we would have shared costs when we moved here. And it, it, incumbent, it encompassed a lot more than it does now. More and more things are being taken out, more and more charges put on individuals. I think $25 up front is fine, but every month for someone, I, I agree with uh, Sue Margolis, to charge that every month to someone who's probably struggling to try to get to the point to where they can handle it better. I just think it's wrong with shared costs. Thank you for your comment. <clears throat> Next uh, is Mary Stone. Well, we have, okay. Mary. Uh, Mary Stone, 356C. I think uh, Maxine has not looked at the financial delinquency reports uh, in a long time. Because as I recall, most of the delinquent accounts were estates or things of that nature. They weren't just individuals. And the, because most individuals, you know, pay their assessments regularly. And uh, it's just when the... Uh, person passes and the estate is not settled, there's a lot of assessments that accrue. And, and also, uh, like I remember a number of uh, the reverse mortgages, they, they, the reverse mortgage companies, while they're in the process of, of uh, disposing of the uh, property, they, uh, they didn't pay either. So we're, we're not talking about, generally talking about individuals, we're generally talking about uh, estates and these financial institutions. Uh, the other thing is, is this is a, my understanding was that this is a specific amount that is delinquent at a specific point of time, and they want to take a specific number of months to pay off this specific amount. So that knowing that there's, this is the principal, knowing that it's going to be, the interest is going to be charged for that principal for a certain period of time, that is calculated. Uh, the number of months is calculated because you know how many months you're having a plan. So I think the numbers are pretty definite. And so uh, when, you, when you think about the, the uh, services that we have to pay for, for the, uh, our credit company, you know, our uh, bad debts company collection. to collect collection, thank you. Words out of my mouth there. Um, the collection company, those are all expenses, and those are not something to be shared because I don't want to pay for your bad debt. Sorry, mm -hmm. you know I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. I, can, I I want to pay for the use and the opportunity for the use of certain things. I'm willing to share that cost, but I'm not willing to share your bad debt. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Right, thank you, <clears throat> Director Morrison. Yeah. To back up what Mary just said, um, I agreed to sharing the cost of golf and different, different things in the village, but I did not sign on to pay 
the delinquencies that people are not paying. Director Blackwell. No comment. Well, I'm sorry, I had you in here for a comment. <clears throat> Didn't you speak? Yeah, I did. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, you only got to speak once. The same with you, Mr. Chorn. Well, I think the, uh, <clears throat> we see something here. That, that's, second that's your second time speaking. Well, you should have said it on the first time. You only get one opportunity to speak on each of the uh, uh, motions. All right, we also have uh, <clears throat> Ms. Broomgren from the audience who wanted to speak. My original, my original thing, I misguided myself, and so I would like to speak on follow-up of Maxine's comments. Um, I totally agree with her that uh, this is a shared community, and we all pay our share for what we all bought into and used. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I also agree with Mary Stone, who <laughs> says, and, and others of you who we, we didn't buy into paying for other people's debt. And so that's a complicated thing. But I also want to add, and, and I have this question, because I understand that the things that GRF are doing, some of them you, some of us, whoever are represented, have to vote on those things as well. And one of them is that we are not going to charge any more for certain amenities that we pay for as shared people. But when our guests come, they're going to be able to use them for free. For some reason, it costs too much to charge them and collect the fee. And my view on that is, if it costs more, then you should charge more. Don't just let us pay for people who want their families to come and use the facilities and swim in the pools and use the fitness centers, which I think are big things for outside people. And um, I also agree that we should not base our um, cost on what outside people are doing, golf courses, et cetera, but what it costs us to maintain it. And then we, if it costs more, our fee goes up. But you know, so if it costs more to charge somebody who doesn't live here, because I can envision an awful lot of people coming here, a lot of friends who will want to come and use our facilities. So I'm, I'm just saying that both of them are <coughs> right. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, and I'm also appealing for when, when it comes up to vote on the GRF issue of non-charging that yeah. we don't vote. Well, that's not voted on at by their this board. meeting. They said they will be asking G United and Third and everybody. So I we have people on that committee, but yes. they vote. Uh, we as a board do not vote. It does not come up to us. It so uh, it might be a corporate member. Those members people are not issue. a part of. We we do not sit on this. We do. We do. We do. It's we have two people that sit on that committee. Well, I'm appealing to those two people. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I might point out that the shared costs principally are for the amenities. We have never had shared costs for our assessments. Each one is different. Even in United, we do not. We have a basic assessment, but depending on your property tax and improvements you've made to your unit, et cetera, uh, it changes from person to person, so we don't have a bank on that. All right, uh, do I have anybody else that wants to speak? All right, <coughs> Andre, you may now have a second turn. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, uh, in the accounts payable system, accounts receivable system, usually there's a terminology <coughs> called the terms and conditions. In this one, we have the 10% penalty, but we don't have the terms. How often is it 
at due time, or it's uh, one day after that, if you put in one day late, you will be fined for 10%. And uh, uh, all those issues, I believe we, we need to have that kind of a detailed information in We there. do have it, Andre. If you would like to look at the original one, it says when the assessment is due. due. So, so and it due is time. considered past due on a certain date. I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly. 13 days until a month or whatever, but okay. it is written out. Okay, so I amend this uh, assessment and payment plan by stating that whereas a member who missed, uh, misses timely regular assessment on due date is entitled to make a return, re return request, mm -hmm. a member who misses timely regular assessment payment on due date is entitled just the changes and amend that. What timely means? Is there we can, we can, if we can, or there, we can remove the. Is there uh, a second uh, to his amendment? Seeing none, we will vote on the original uh, motion. Okay. All right, uh, <clears throat> look, working with your screens, all those in favor of the original motion, which is written on the screen there, please vote. Are we going to change the uh, stock in at all on the interest issue? Are we going to change this? No. It doesn't need to. <coughs> it's a tie. It's a tie. So we need to. Motion fails. No, a no motion fails if it's a tie, correct, right. Anthony? Yes. Maggie, I mean, uh, Juanita. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion to send this back to committee, taking a look at this, and consider right. some of the points that have been made here, including this a second double that. interest. Do I have a second for I that? Have a, I second it. All right. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded that we move the... Um, Pay, revised payment plan agreement for assessments back to our committee. I have a comment. Uh, the, uh, the reason why I, I have an issue with this is the fact that I think we're talking apples and oranges here. It's my personal opinion. When a person is remanded to collection and has some issues and it's a, a, a specific situation whereby there was a uh, this uh, inheritance going on, I understand that. And if they haven't paid it for like three or four months, didn't say a word, and then all of a sudden somebody wakes up and says, listen, you owe us back assessments, that's one thing. And I think that's what we were talking about here. But when the individual who is making his payments and then falls on hard times and is going to call up and say, listen, I can't make the next two payments and I need some help here, okay? That's a completely different situation. And that's my problem here with the fact that you're now going to give that person and charge them $25 a month and what have you. I'm not talking about the people that have these, these type of situations where they're inheriting things where they got gazillions of dollars, okay? I'm talking about the, the rank and file person. And that's why I think this thing here needs to address those two situations. That's my personal issue. All right, I have a motion. Do I have a second to return it to committee? It was, it's been seconded. It oh, I'm sorry. Carl and Emmanuel. And Carl, all right. Uh, let's vote, please. <clears throat> Elsie, you want to give me your verbal vote? Sometimes I think. We're still missing one vote. We have 10 minutes cash. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I was looking at this stain. You are correct. <clears throat> All right. Uh, we will send this back to committee. All right. Yes. So, Carl, are you asking that somehow we divide 
the fact that someone is in financial jeopardy and can't afford it versus someone that can afford it? Is that where you kind of went with that? If you, if you look in here, it does not talk about the fact that it was remanded to collection and it's been going on for months. Right, and we never do. We, like, payment plans are only done if it has gone through collections. Yeah. And, and that's where it's, <clears throat> not, it's All not right, so we need to state here. that, okay? All right. All right, let's go on to 13C. <clears throat> LC, yes. All right. Sorry. Yes, Elsie. I'm sorry, this is real quick. Uh, I just want to point out that this payment plan is, is voluntary. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And it's, well, yeah, but it's not like we're forcing a $25 a month <coughs> no. uh, fee on an unwilling, nailed down victim. Uh, I just, and I'm not support, I just want to, I'm sorry, I don't feel very well. I just want to emphasize this is a voluntary plan. Right. That's all. The resident has to request. We do not offer a payment plan. They have to request a payment plan. And it's usually after they have been delinquent for a few months. Jeff, you had a comment? Oh, and, and to Elsie's point, I think it's important to understand that <coughs> payment plans um, provide a standard which should treat any and all members the same regardless of their backgrounds because there's a lot of legal issues involved with how that payment plan is processed and uh, United being open up to discrimination claims and claims for violating the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Um, so we have to make sure that whatever standards you come up with that they pass legal muster because there's a lot of legal risk in this area, a lot. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go on to 13C. Yeah, that's a question. I'm, I'm totally confused. Uh, but this, this is a pay, May this I suggest a, that you come to the Finance Committee and ask your question there since we have sent it back to committee? Okay. All right. 13C, this is the payment plan uh, for chargeable services. Would you read it, please, or summarize it for us, please? <clears throat> this is a person who has monetary penalties, fines, fees, or chargeable services. For example, if you are going to restore your yellow staked area to United, then the landscape department has to come out and remove all of your plants and replant new stuff. And that will be done as a chargeable service to the person. If uh, you have a water leak and we have to repair the building, uh, that may be a chargeable service to you for certain parts of that or all of it, depending on what your insurance and whatever it has. That could be a charge to you. This is the ability to ask for a payment plan to repay charges that have you have made you have incurred. It is a voluntary thing. You can always just write a check or, or do whatever you do. Hopefully but if you insurance. wish if you wish to have a payment plan, this will enable you to do it. So um, it's a request by the person. Uh, you have an administrative fee every month. The agreement is in effect, shall be added to the member's assessment account. Interest shall accrue on fees and chargeable services charges, if any, pursuant to the terms of the applicable work order or services agreement. No interest, this is the bottom line, no interest shall accrue on monetary penalties unless or until a judgment is obtained by the mutual for same. All right, and the administrative fee of $25 per month and interest as allowed. So I move this resolution. Is there a second for her motion to put this forward? I'll second. Thank you. And again, this will go to our February meeting, right, Cheryl? 
Correct. <laughs> because it, <clears throat> it's being passed in 2018, and the new 28 days doesn't go into effect until 2019. All right, discussion. Uh, <clears throat> Director Armendariz. Thank you. Uh, I just have a small edit change here on page uh, 3 of 5, agenda item 13C. The third line down from the top should be a space there after board of directors, space for repayment. Right now they're running together. See that third oh. line down? Yes. Okay, thank you. Just an edit change. Yeah. That's all. We call us Scribner's. Right, right. <laughs> all right, we will fix and that. Space, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Director Trong, you wanted to speak on this? Uh, thank you. Uh, still the same thing, whereas any member who is unable to timely pay monetary penalties, so that's the same thing, the same problem with the previous uh, uh, resolution. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Do I have, I don't have any other speakers on my list. Anybody mm -hmm. else? Vote? All right, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt the uh, payment plan agreement and introduce a resolution. We have the resolution for payment plan fee policy for monetary penalties, fees, and chargeable services. Okay, please vote. All right, <clears throat> the vote is eight to two, it passes. All right, now we get down to item 14 on our agenda, and this is committee reports. And i just like to preview this by saying there are, because of the holidays, a lot of meetings were canceled, moved around, postponed a month, et cetera. So uh, we do not have full reports on all of our uh, committees for this month. So let's start though with our finance committee, financial report, Director Morrison. <clears throat> there you go, they're up there. So the total revenue for United through October 31st, 2018 was 34,019,000. Compared to expenses of $34,789,000, resulting in a net loss of $770,000. Slide two, please. Through October, United Mutual was better than budget by $313,000, primarily due to employee compensation related to the uh, progress of certain reserve programs, such as tree maintenance, dry rot, building structures that have been delayed, but work is in progress in the reporting period. Staff anticipates spending most of the budget by the end of December. Manor water heaters are being installed by an outside vendor, which leads to a favorable variance in compensation. Paint program has a favorable variance due to a smaller, mostly single-story building being painted, with, which require fewer materials and fewer hours. Materials and supplies have a fa favorable variance due to a different manufacturer water heaters being used in the community for the first part of the year. However, the board decided to go back to using a 10-year warranty of water heaters. Outside services, timing, the dry rot repair program began in August and landscape, landscape revitalization project began in November. Slide three, please. On this pie chart, we show non-assessment revenues received to date of 1,401,000 by category, starting with the largest revenue generating category, fees and charges to residences, residents, followed by interest income, laundry revenue, and so forth. Slide four, please. On this pie chart, we see the expenses to date of 34,789,000 showing our largest categories of expense are for employee compensation and property taxes, followed by outside services, utilities, and so forth. Slide five, please. 
The reserve balances on October 31, 2018 were $22,323,000. Year-to-date contributions and interest to reserves were $10,255,000. Year-to-date expenditures were $10,365,000. Our delinquency report, um, our current month count is 19. Our prior month count was 16. We have an increase of three. It was at $95,797 and now is, or is now 95,000 and was 82,731. So it's up $13,066. We had one foreclosure sale in December uh, or set up to go in December. Uh, we have a foreclosure sale going up in January, and we have two notice of sales prepared and sent for publication. We have one lien prepared, and we have five proposed payment plans. Chargeable services delinquency report, we had 21, as opposed to the prior month, well, they were the same, However, we had an increase in value uh, of $14,151. Our resales, uh, this year to date, we had uh, 307 sales as compared to a year ago, 395, so we're down 88. And uh, we're down 22.3%. Our sales volume for October 2018 or as of that date, was 85,826,240. Our sales volume as of October a year ago was 100,429,876. So we are down 14,603,636. So we're down 14.5%. Um, our average resale price this year to date is 279,477 and last year 253,904. So we're up 25,573 or uh, we're up 10%. Our monthly leasing, um, we're at 9%, so it went up 1% from the previous month. Um, at our finance committee, um, we authorized a $40,000 uh, fee for a reserve study and uh, which we brought that bill to forward today well we didn't have to vote on it but we vote, brought it forward um, we the proposed 2019 business plan for United Mutual the total basic assessment per manor per month is going to be 578.52, including the GRF portion, for a total increase of $9.53 per manor per month, or 2% compared to the uh, current year. Uh, herbicide. And uh, we had one of our directors was asking where I was getting my information, and it comes from Bruce Hartley. And he is stating that if we go or we do away with Roundup, um, that our labor costs will be doubled or tripled, and our cost per unit will increase 550 to 790 per unit per month. So um, I just averaged this out and came up with anywhere between $12 and $13 per unit per month after we have to double everything for 2020 when we pull from the reserves for 2019 and they were not authorized. Um, one thing that I want to bring forward also is to remind everyone to check to make sure that they have an H06 insurance policy. Uh, if you have, for example, a water leak that intrudes on your neighbors, you can be responsible. We have an example of a resident who was responsible for between $200,000 and $300,000 for a leak. 
Um, and I'm not sure that they had insurance, but I hope they do because this would be a difficult situation for any one of us to encounter. So make sure you check with your insurance agent that you have an H06 insurance policy. With loss of use. Huh? With loss of use. With loss of use, thank you. That's an add-on. Um, <laughs> we, at our last finance committee meeting, we um, established an investment policy task force um, and so there's an RFI uh, that's going to be issued to different vendors um, to give us, it's going to be sent out so that different investment companies can come back with uh, bids on what they can do for us. And um, safety is our number one concern. Um, we want to make sure that we're working with a vendor that has our best interests at heart. We have um, two people that are on this task force from 3rd, United, and GRF. So we have Michael Cunningham, Steve Leonard, Gary Morrison, Jack Connolly, Diane Phillips, and Greg Corigliano. Uh, Moisture intrusion, um, we're working forward as quickly as we can. Um, our plumbing leaks so far have, looks like we're on track to save approximately 400,000 over last year. So it looks like we're making some headway. Um, supply line remediation, um, we have not really done anything this year with supply line. We've put everything into moisture intrusion, and that's because most of the costs incurred um, have been in moisture intrusion. So we're putting off the supply line till we get that taken care of. Then we'll come back and hit the supply lines. That supply line has been estimated at about $8,500 per unit, which is about $50 million. Handyman program seems to be going well. Um, we continue to have people sign up. Um, we have um, electric panel replacements. Um, they've also been kind of put on hold a little bit till we get some of the other things taken care of. And um, uh, flood buzz, um, the board uh, voted down last time, so we will not be instituting flood buzz. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. All right, our next report is from the Architectural Control and Standards Committee. Uh, and <clears throat> Director Akrakar is the chair of that, and he is not with us, so uh, Director Randazza will give the report. Yeah, Short and, sweet. and uh, the Architectural Controls did not meet this past month, so I have nothing to report. There are a number of resolutions that we're going to be going through at our next architectural meeting, which will be happening on December 20th at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Communications Committee, Director Blackwell. Uh, yes, the breeze should be coming out any day. Uh, we submitted ours on time a month ago. As always, we had uh, Juanita wrote President's remarks telling about what happened at the meeting. Cash reported on committees. Carl reported on MNC. Gary reported on finance. Carl reported on the energy task force. And Elsie reported on Elsie. <laughs> and so uh, <coughs> if there's room there, we have a a landscape article on trees, but that will take us over the top, so I said you could expend that if you want. So we'll see if that one goes or not. That's my report. We will meet whenever we feel it's necessary. Okay, thank you. All right, the next report is from the Member Hearings Committee, and again, Director Akrakar is the chair of that this year. So with in his absence, I'll just let you know that we had a meeting in November. We have it every month. 
Our next meeting is December 27th. Uh, and we basically, I think we had 22 items to look at at the November meeting. And that included damage restoration. Uh, and of course, discipline and uh, financial backlog for liens and things like that. So um, that's the 27th. And those are not open meetings. Those are closed meetings because of the confidentialities that we need. Uh, the Governing Docs Review Committee, Director Blackburn. Uh, yes, we met on uh, November 26th. Uh, we discussed the caregiver policy uh, that third has passed. We have a standard caregiver policy for medical caregivers, for medical reasons. The question is, is there another policy? Well, third wrote a new policy or included a new policy, which, which lessened all the requirements somehow. Basically but for home aids. Hmm? Basically for home aids. Ba basically removing all the medical parts of the requirements and reporting parts, which made them just uh, home aides or people assisting you for whatever reason. Um, considering code 31.5, we need to take a little different look at that and be careful because we are liable to lose or endanger our 55 status community. And so we are reviewing that very carefully. Uh, the state has come up with another category which might be useful for us. So we're now digging into that one. Uh, we also discussed uh, canvassing policy suitable for mutuals and GRF, and we asked Jeff to look into that with the other attorneys and see what we need to do. That will allow members to maybe post some kind of sign at the door that says do not disturb or no solicitation or something like that. Or it will allow other people to knock at the door or deliver flyers. So that's up. Then we will, we will be considering soon, this is the future agenda items which came out of our last board meeting. Andre was wondering where the future agenda items go that don't come. So they came back to us. This is the parking for resident-driven commercial vehicles. That was the whole question we had last time. So that went back to governing documents to clarify that up so that we see what that actually means. And so that's, we will, we have other things we might reconsider guarantors. Our next meeting will be December 18th, 18th at 1.30. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to keep you busy. The next report is the Landscape Committee. Oh, yes. Well, yes, the Landscape Committee has concluded the test and the agenda package online tells you everything you need to know about the test and what the conclusions were and what the costs will be. Uh, my report in the breeze is if no if no organic works well. We are not going to apply an ineffective organic four times a month, hoping it's going to cut down. So that's why we ran the test. So if no organic works, then the cost was $600,000 per team that we would need, and we might need two extra teams a year, which comes out to quite a chunk of change. If an organic works somewhat, that will lessen that weeding need for the laborers. That, of course, will save us money. But the applications for will be repeated frequently. I mean, let's face it, Roundup kills it for quite a while. <laughs> but the organics are, are much more gentle. So, so we will have to weigh these, all, all these issues, and we'll talk about them in the Landscape Committee. But so, so it is not a pretty picture on either side. We know it's not pretty. But we'll do the best we can at the meeting and come back to you later. Thank you. Okay, and our, again, reminder, it's this Thursday in the boardroom at 9 o'clock. <clears throat>
Uh, our next report is from the MNC committee. Doc, Director Randazza. The uh, MNC committee uh, met in October, and I reported on that uh, during our November board meeting. And I also have put the results of that meeting in gory detail in the breeze, as uh, Director Blackwell has indicated. Some of the other things that were discussed are ongoing, have been mentioned by our finance committee and uh, Shaban with regard to the uh, Shepherd's Crook and the uh, uh, waste, waistline remediation issues. So at this particular point in time, uh, there's nothing else to report on the MNC committee uh, with the exception of what I stated in the breeze and uh, the next meeting is February 27th next, next year. Next year, wow, where did this year go? Yeah. All right. And that's you have a report on the task, task force. force. And the task force is the same way. Uh, the next meeting, however, with the task force is on January 9th, and a lot of the information that was uh, generated as a result of the task force meeting that happened uh, back last month, uh, and I also reported on last board meeting, uh, is in the breeze also. So on January 9th, we have our next task force meeting. I'd just like to mention that at the Energy Task Force, it is a task force, not a committee, <clears throat> for the whole there. Uh, they did elect uh, officers for the coming year, and Director Randazzo was elected vice chair. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, the next is the report of the Resident Advisory Committee. <clears throat> the Resident Advisory Committee is unique to United, and we put it in because we had complaints, if you will, from residents who said, three minutes is not enough to go over the problems that I have. And sometimes I want to bring in neighbors or two or three people and it just doesn't work very well in the public comments. So a couple of years ago, we set up the Resident Advisory Committee. It meets at four o'clock on the Thursday following our board meeting. And we made it at four o'clock because again, we had people say, I work and I don't want to take off a whole day to make a 10 o'clock meeting or something like that. So it's more convenient for our working residents to be able to take off a couple hours earlier in the afternoon and attend. Resident Advisory Committee is a committee made up of uh, a number of directors, some long-term residents who are our resident advisors on that committee, and staff. And people can come in and talk as long as they want to on what their problem is and how they've tried to, to uh, solve it. And we can suggest other ways that they can go out and try to solve that problem. Our staff liaison is fantastic and she goes, <clears throat> she takes that information and goes to other departments and tries to uh, uh, get contact between the resident and the other departments because many of them just have no idea how to solve it and so they just live with it and complain. And that's not what we want. So uh, if you have an issue that you would like to discuss with the board, uh, please come to the Resident Advisory Committee four o'clock on December 13th in the Sycamore Room. All right, item 15 is GRF committee highlights. And again, many of them did not meet because of the holidays. So we'll start with uh, Director Morrison and the Finance Committee. Okay, we uh, discussed the need for emergency generators and a lot of this was for the disaster prepared task force and the need uh, to provide generators to maybe provide oxygen, to provide energy uh, for radio communication, et cetera, in case of a major earthquake or, you know, uh, whatever might, might happen to the village. We discussed the 3% tariffs and the effects on budget versus actual. We discussed the trust facility fee policy and the assessment of a one-time non-refundable non -refundable origination fee of $300 for the preparation of the promissory note and related records discussion also on payment options, late charges, and prepayment. We discussed insurance renewals for GRF. Um, we discussed supplemental funding for gate renovations, uh, and 
and uh, a motion was made and carried unanimously to recommend the board approve additional funding for gatehouse renovations supplemental funding for a community energy consultant so that was for fifty thousand dollars and uh, each of us united grf and third all contributed fifty thousand dollars to this um, energy consultant energy consultant energy consultant yes um, GRF is on budget. It right uh, as of 930 2018, it differs by 753,000. It's under budget. Um, I think everyone was interested in Clubhouse 3, and that has been scaled back to $2 million. And that $2 million is being spent for items that are required by law. So Open that safety. safety, yes. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Oh, I have yeah. two. I didn't give um, the, our next finance meeting for um, our finance yeah. committee is January 29, 2019 at 2 p.m. in the Sycamore Room. And for GRF, it's December the 19th at 1.30 p.m. in the boardroom, and everyone is invited to either and or both. All right, those are all open meetings. All right, may we have a report, please, on the Community Activities Committee? Director Margolis. We met on and uh, we discussed and voted on no fees for the fitness center and swimming pools. It was really important that the swimming pools have no fees because the lifeguard collecting money hasn't got a chance to look and keep track of people in the swimming pool. And we are really paying him to do the swimming pool watching. Very few people have been using our facilities for their friends and neighbors, and they have to be come with the person so it isn't that anybody from the outside can just walk in and use our facilities. And we found that it was less than 300 people per year. So it's not a big expense. There was one vote that we voted down, which was putting flags on pool two to indicate the end of the pool when you're swimming black backstroke. It was deemed that it wasn't of value to us. And the next meeting? The next meeting will be January 10th, and we go over all of the activities that are planned and so forth, so you're very welcome to come and hear about the new plans. Thank you. Uh, the next GRF committee is the Landscape Committee. Director Blackwell? Uh, we didn't meet last month, but we are meeting this month, as it says, on the 19th at 2.30. And usually we talk about water and we will talk about the creek and so on. I think the garden centers are pretty much flowing on their own now. Thank goodness that that great mountain has been climbed. So it's just 2.30 at this room. Oh, in the sycamore room, they say. Yep, sycamore okay. room. Okay, thank okay. you. <clears throat> the next MNC committee. Uh, GRF committee is MNC, Director Rendoza. So uh, <clears throat> we met on November 13th, and uh, a couple of things that we discussed were the uh, Clubhouse 2 video club expansion. Uh, we're still working on how the details are going to be uh, worked out with regard to how that expansion may or may not happen. Uh, chemical storage at the five pool facilities with PowerPoint, uh, the uh, chemical storage facilities for the five pools at Clubhouse 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6 are not up to code and need to be rebuilt. Staff was direct directed to issue an RFP to get this work done. Uh, this is currently a work in progress. The uh, next thing we discussed was the paddle and pickle ball courts, which in the process right now, I believe, Siobhan, uh, they have been poured, have they not? That's correct, and the light poles are installed as well as uh, the fencing, and they're going to work on the surface later this week. Okay. 
And then uh, last but not least was the uh, Clubhouse 2 Annex project, which has been discussed on TV and various different board meetings or what have you. That is a little grassy area adjacent to the uh, Clubhouse 2, which uh, is now uh, operational, I understand. Excuse me? Passive Park. Passive Park, excuse me. Passive Park, got to use the right terminology. And the next meeting for GRF uh, MNC is tomorrow at 9.30 in the boardroom. So if you want to join us, uh, meet us tomorrow at 9.30 here. Thank you. That's it. <clears throat> um, I might just expand a little bit and make sure everybody understands it's not the pools that need to be redone and are out of compliance. It's the storage building for the chemicals to go in the pools that need to be updated. Very small thing. Yes, I just want to reemphasize it. Thank you. All right, Media and Communication Committee, Director Blackwell. OK, uh, we met November 19th, and we had a plethora of information about TV shows and channels and so on and so on, and the analog channel. We should have all the analogs Gone. removed. They Goodbye, are. sayonara, at the end of the year. Sayonara. Which frees, yay, frees up everywhere. all kinds of space for us. However, we still have um, an NBC uh, cost of facing 20% hike, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, our fees are, will be as low as, as possible. We are in a pool with other smaller areas, smaller than cities, and the pool is nationwide. And so by getting together, we get a somewhat better deal than we would if we just came in as ourselves. But um, we face some, some fee raises for our channels next year. Uh, our subscriber counts are up digital. We have 13,000 residents or homes in the village of those 6,080 have digital, and so that's very good. Um, we have a whole lot of people going to more and more exotic things, and we will install and so on, so it's a big deal. Uh, this committee also uh, dealt with realtor signs uh, because uh, residents are complaining about the placement and the coloring and the nuisance of realtor signs, so we selected a very pleasant looking sign color that everyone will ascribe to. And parts of them have been placed out, but as of yet they're not quite due because they all have to go redo their signs now to meet our specifications. So that's that. And I think that's all we have until next month. So we're meeting December 17th. Oh, Thrive also. Thrive is, is a series of shows that shows how through being active in the village, people are doing well mentally and physically, at least one way, or happily, emotionally even. So that, is, that has been an ongoing committee. And uh, we put on shows. There are shows that come on every Thursday and Saturday morning, usually. And, and those are good to watch for uplifting. So there are a lot of people out there filming that. Uh, but it, we've been meeting monthly, and it was decided that we don't really need to meet monthly. So, so we'll try and keep everybody's spirits up by meeting semi-monthly. Thank you. So we are not meeting until January 23rd for Thrive. All right, our next report is from the Mobility and Vehicles Committee. And just so everybody knows, that's the bus situation. And uh, Director Addington, do you have a report on that? Um, this was the first time as uh, active members of the committee that uh, Director Torn and I were um, present. So it was fun and a learning experience and uh, a lively time was had by all. Because 
We talked about uh, a lot about, I know this is a great surprise to everybody, but there's an ongoing argument about whether or not we should have uh, the buses every seven, every seven, I mean, seven days a week, and whether we should go back to the old system, et cetera, et cetera. So there was quite a little discussion on that and the plan ride, and uh, it was pretty jolly. There's also a new um, chair for that committee, and it's Ray Gross. And uh, so all the way around, it was a definite, oh, and it was Bruce Hartley's last meeting um, I was looking forward to working with Bruce, but I guess it wasn't in the cards and or in Andres. So Bruce is gone, but we, as we found out earlier in this meeting, um, there's at least a new person in charge of the um, transportation side of that particular office. So uh, it's nice to have somebody new, but it was too bad that Bruce is leaving. Anyway, the things we went over was, were, uh, first of all, they needed, oh, sorry, I just I talked about the change in, the change in command. Um, there's no longer a position open with uh, transportation and maintenance because it's been filled. Sorry about that. So I covered that. Uh, Bruce is gone. Oh, there was a destroyed vehicle. We had a, uh, it was really too bad. Uh, one of our vans got totaled not too long ago, and so they need $45,000 to replace it. And I asked about the insurance just as a matter of curiosity, but it turns out, uh, I, I don't want to go real far on that, except to say that there was no insurance reimbursement on the totaled vehicle. I'll just stop there. But I did ask about insurance. Anyway, it's $45,000 to replace the vehicle. So that they need it. They have to have it. And that's for the plan ride. And then they also we also talked about an early release. But it turns out it's not really an early release, as Bert pointed out, because it's not they can't, these funds can't be released at the very soonest until January, which makes them not early. The really weighty issues at this particular meeting. So this was for $811,800, which is a lot of money. And of that, and this is besides the $45,000 to replace the earlier bus uh, van. So the, uh, that money is, is comprised of seven cargo vans for $301,800, and those are all uh, to replace, as I understand it, current but worn out or otherwise ineffective cargo vans. Because uh, cause this is a GRF committee, so this is for, for everybody. This isn't just United, obviously. So um, also included in that was 440000 for the replacement of four buses. And with the elimination of these four oldest buses, it's also going to eliminate the last of the the last of the buses that are still under the obligations brought on by a federal grant. I'm not, this is my, I'm new to this committee, but there's some restrictions stuck onto uh, buses that we bought with a federal grant, but with, that, with the buses gone, then the restrictions are gone, and I don't quite get the significance of that, but I'm sure I'll learn. So that, oh, oh, and for those of you doing your math, out of the 811,800, there was 301,800 that went towards the seven cargo vans, 440,000 for the replacement of four buses. And now this is my personal favorite. If you added that up, you're $70,000 short. But wait, there's more. The industrial scrubber. There's $70,000, which is cool. I just had no idea. For the M20 model, Tenant Corporation Industrial Scrubber. And what it does is it scrubs uh, concrete and apparently, the, and, and it degreases. And uh, we currently rent a, a similar machine twice each year to clean Garden Villa garages, but it's not cleaning the clubhouse areas. With the new machine, 
we'll be able to explain, ex expand the concrete scrubbing program. So that was about it, uh, and everything was approved and went along, and uh, it was a wonderful meeting and very lively. And that's the end of my report, and I apologize for my delivery. I don't feel well. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> the next is the Security Community Access Committee. Uh, do I have a report from uh, Director Bastani or, let's see, I think the other one is Director Liberatore. Aren't you on that? Yeah, I was on that. Okay. All right, I'll just mention then that the next meeting is December 17th, 9.30 in the boardroom. The traffic hearings, again, were Director Akrakar, uh no, Director Addington. Did you have a report on the traffic hearings? You, I know you just went on. <laughs> um, gosh, no, we had traffic hearings. Everything was taken care of. Uh, nothing major to report. Okay, thank you. The next traffic hearings are going to be December 19th. Uh, we have two sessions. They are closed sessions. You will get notes if you are expected to be there. Uh, <clears throat> one at 9.30 and one at 1. Uh, <clears throat> Disaster Preparedness Task Force. Uh, Director Morrison, I think you were the one that was there this time. Yeah. Um, we discussed uh, door hangers to be used in case of an emergency and what these are are going to be just almost like on a hotel door that you're going to hang on the handle and that will tell emergency squad if we have uh, someone inside who is in dire straits in need of, of emergency help and then we can move on to the this is for your uh, good neighbor captains as they they're going around to all of their residences checking to see if everyone is okay or someone needs help if they need help there'll be a hanger put on the door handle so that it alerts emergency um, as we discussed before we're creating a code red for emergency um, the last california earthquake shakeout we had good medical feedback um, everything seemed to go pretty well. There are some minor things that need to be adjusted. Um, Saddleback Hospital is giving Laguna Woods a social worker commencing 11-28-2018. And this is supposed to be of little to no cost to the village. So that's pretty nice. We are working on training for shutoff valves for gas electric um, and water. Um, and this is also for good neighbor captains so that in case of an emergency, we can shut the building down if we see there's going to be a fire or, or water leaks or whatever. Um, so, and I don't know where they are. So that's kind of where we started with this. Someone's gonna come around and uh, show us where all of these valves or electrical panels are so that we can shut them down. CPR classes are scheduled for March 4th. Um, the representatives for uh, DPTF or um, the Disaster Prepared Tax Task Force are going to be Cash Akrakar, myself, and Juanita Skillman will be the alternate. Next committee meeting will be Tuesday, January the 29th at the Community Center in the Cypress Room. Um, I, one other thing, um, we ask you if you're at all interested in helping your neighbors to donate your time and experience and become a good neighbor captain. Um, basically, what you're doing is going around and gathering information so that you know the people that you're um, that are relying on you, and vice versa. And in case of an emergency, you're available to help them out and guide emergency to where they need to go. That's all I have. Um, Thank you. Let's see. <clears throat> Our next meeting there is January the 29th, 9:30 a.m. in the Cypress Room. Thank you. Um, I have gone off that committee, and uh, Director Levatori is now on disaster transfers. Okay. <clears throat> All 
All right, uh, <coughs> those are our GRF committee reports. And so I would like to now just summarize the future agenda items. These were items that were uh, introduced in November, but there was not 30 days between our November and December meeting. So they will be brought forward at our January meeting for second reading and a vote. And those include five alterations, uh, revisions to uh, various standards, and also um, a motion to update the vehicle traffic and parking rules, and a motion to uh, accept, adopt resolutions for revisions to the land use alteration policy. Those were all presented last month. If you want to go through and read them, et cetera, they're in our agenda package and uh, under future agenda items. So now we will go to item number 17, which is director comments. And I'll start over here with Director Margolis. I have no comments this afternoon. Okay. Director Libatori. No comments, Madam Chair. Thank okay. you. Director Morrison. My only uh, comment is since what's coming back to finance committee um, as the language or whatever, or what we're trying to do as far as the penalties and whatever. I'd like to know, I guess, what everyone's feelings are so we're not sitting there twiddling our thumbs at the meeting. So if everyone can give me some <coughs> feedback on what they'd like to see, I'd be happy to take it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Blackwell. Uh, yes, as far as I know, uh, from the list of future things, I went through the entire year of everything that was listed for future things, and one of them is use of GRF facilities by non-members, and that's a different thing that we take to them. That was not decided on, or it was decided on, not in this. The other one is the golf cart plug-in fee, and let's see, I think that's all. Wait, one more. Of course, the commercial vehicle parking. So those are the only three out of the whole year that have that were stated that were not covered already this year, including the ones that Juanita just read. So they don't fall into a black hole, apparently. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Director Andasa. Uh, I have no comments. Thank you. Thank you. Director Amandiris. Thank you, Juanita. Um, first, I want to compliment all the directors. I think today has been one of the most efficient meetings I have ever attended, and I hope it's a sign of a good trend that we're going to continue into the future. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to repeat again, uh, I want to thank Shabon and her staff again for all the hard work they're doing right now, because I know we're having, I, I was informed by Dick Rader that I missed an important VMS meeting where there's a, an update on staff turnover, and so that does not make their job any easier. And uh, if Shabon is able to, I'd like to have her in, bring us up to date on where we are with uh, replacement of uh, CEO and any other important positions right now. First off, Director Armandares, I would like to thank you for your comments, and I will share them with our staff. I think our president's probably more Able yeah, to I happen to, to be on the search committee. Uh, and without breaching any confidentiality, I'd like to tell you that there were 16 applicants. It was narrowed down to eight. And at our last meeting, we <clears throat> narrowed it down to five to interview this week. One dropped out over the weekend, so we will be interviewing four candidates Thursday of this week. Thank you. <clears throat> Director Trung. Torn. I always say it wrong. Yes, Torn, uh, Torn, uh, they're all the same. I've been called worse, so that's fine with me. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and I appreciate uh, uh, all the input uh, from all the directors. We had a very uh, productive meeting. Uh, what I want to say is uh, if we look at the uh, uh, committee assignments, you can see all the chairs are 
by uh, occupied by the uh, executive councils. Some of them even have a three, two, three uh, chairs. So uh, I understand it's the chair uh, and uh, member assignments are determined by the councils, but uh, apparently uh, it, uh, they favor themselves a lot. And uh, I would, uh, and I heard a lot of people uh, uh, talk about uh, a lot of talk about uh, on the board that it's unfair for other anyone to take so much responsibility, and other people don't take any responsibilities. And I would challenge that uh, if anybody that uh, think they are overloaded, uh, please let me know, and I will be more than happy to help out. Uh, if nobody wants to help out, please uh, let's not talk about this. Anybody's overloaded. Uh, you. Uh, those people that want to have more uh, workload, uh, let's not complain about that. And last time uh, during the uh, meeting, uh, Director Blackwell has uh, expressed uh, uh, opinion that uh, she's willing to let me handle the, uh, take over the media and the community chair. Uh, I gave it thought afterwards, initially I, I declined that, but I gave it thought afterwards. I think it's uh, probably, uh, if anything I can help out, I'd be more than happy to help out. So if the media and communication uh, is too much workload as for the secretary and doing the secretary work and the other three chairman responsibilities, I'm willing to take on that. And uh, uh, that's basically what I want to say. Thank you very much. Well, I need to comment on that. It is not media and communications. That is a GRF committee. And what she was talking about was if you wanted to join the communications, the United Communications Committee. And she has sent you uh, an email uh, requesting that you write an article, and it goes in, but she was not giving up the chairmanship of the United Communications Committee, and she is not a chair of the Media and Communications Committee. Uh, Two my separate mistake. communities. My mistake. I, I, right. I guess I was talking about Communication <laughs> Committee, and uh, uh, one, uh, uh, Ms. Blackwell was talking about uh, I, I can take over her uh, community, commu uh, community and communication chair. No. And, okay. Uh, so uh, nobody's willing to give up all the uh, chair responsibilities, so let's not talk about anybody's overloaded. Okay. Director Addington? Nothing at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Director? <clears throat> uh, I have a question about the CEO you said to interview four people. Is the board going to know who are these four people or... It, it's confidential. We don't give the names out. There is a search committee that's made up of uh, VMS and United and uh, <clears throat> Third and GRF, and uh, they do the interviews. They rate them, and then we we have a search. What would you call a headhunter? A, a search uh, firm that's working with us, but uh, it is not something that. Uh, individual directors or residents get to vote on. Uh, is it uh, in close uh, meeting? Or would, would you yes. be willing to tell us? No, who they are? I can't. I'll, all I can give you is the numbers that I gave you. The interviews will be on Thursday, uh, and then offers may be made, but until somebody accepts the offer and uh, uh, is accepted by VMS, that's all I can say. Okay, thanks. To echo Director Armendaris, this is the earliest that we have been able to resource in quite a while. We still um, are beat by third, who recessed at uh, 11.30 this time. Uh, GRF was like us, just a little after 12. But uh, this meeting is recessed. <laughs>